if you'd like to give a gift today, um, you can put that in one of the envelopes from a chair pocket <clears throat> and then drop that in the offering boxes on your way out. Um, there are ways to give electronically, either through the website or through a link in our newsletter each week. Uh, and uh, you could always set things up with your bank or credit union as well um, to just occur regularly. Um, thank you for your support, uh, for your support of God's um, ministry here in Roy and uh, one that reaches around the world. If you're a guest today, don't worry about giving. Uh, we are just glad that you are here. Um, thanks for coming today. Uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, uh, that faith comes from hearing and uh, hearing th uh, the good news about Christ. Uh, we want everybody to be able to read and study and apply God's good news to their lives. So if you need a Bible, um, there should be plenty of extra ones laying around today in a rack underneath a chair. Uh, we hope that you'll take one uh, for, uh, for yourself or for a friend that needs one as well. <clears throat> Uh, every time I start out uh, the like the introduction to this sermon, I feel like that movie guy voice ought to be coming in the background. You know which guy I mean? In a time where there is so much chaos and despair. Uh, I, I wrote that with, um, with, with that guy's head uh, voice in my head, apparently. Uh, there is a lot of chaos and despair and surrender in our world. It's a difficult time uh, for everyone. And we all are desperately in need of hope. Um, we have identified hope uh, for the last several weeks as the joyful, confident expectation uh, in God's promises to us. Um, there is uh, nothing better than his promises to us, knowing that he will fulfill all of them. That's what we've been looking at now for, um, for almost two months. We just got another a couple sermons left in this series uh, before Thanksgiving. Um, the Sunday before Thanksgiving will be a little different. Um, I've called it Gratitude Sunday. I've got some great ideas about what it will look like, and I hope that you will uh, choose to come and join us uh, on that Sunday before Thanksgiving. Um, I, I wrote down this question. Um, sort of for myself, after doing a little reading this week. Um, why would anyone choose to be a preaching, teaching pastor? Why would anybody ever choose to be a pastor? Um, I, I found an article this week that listed a handful of reasons. Um, so I've, I've stolen theirs and added a couple of my own. Somebody might choose ministry because they have a desire for attention and to be liked. I mean, how many other people get the opportunity to stand up in front of a captive audience and just say whatever comes to their mind? Messages and ministry can be done to get your ego stroked. Because people say things like, great sermon, wonderful service, um, nobody ever spoke to me like you do. No, nobody said that for a while. <laughs> uh, the downside to that is that sometimes the pendulum swings the other direction. And the fans get really quiet. Or they get angry and get loud. And when that happens there can be some depression. Money certainly can be a motivation. <clears throat> there are mouths to feed and bills to pay at home. Uh, I, I have said for the last 30 years that the preacher should not be the highest paid person in the church. But the preacher also shouldn't be the lowest paid either. Certainly, there are a bunch of pastors who have built a personal fortune, nearly an empire, um, through a career in, in the business of religion. I mean, a pastor can spend their whole career moving from one congregation to another, 
with the promises of financially greener pastures ahead. Another motivation could be popularity, which is a little bit like being liked, but with more of a focus on influence. A pastor might seek lots of public interviews. Um, they're, they're constantly posting and blogging about all sorts of things um, all the time at the expense of ministering to the flock that's been put in their care. Disciple-making takes a distant back seat to influence peddling. Well, what about power and, and control? Some might enter the ministry because they'll have their very own little kingdom where they will have the last word as the final authority as a tin pot dictator who alone speaks for the Lord God Almighty. I always like to throw into this list as well access to all the communion bread and juice they can handle. Um, ultimately, none of these motivations will satisfy, and a ministry that's built on those shaky foundations will fail. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes about what drives him to do ministry. And it isn't free grape juice or fried chicken dinners with an adoring congregation. Let's read uh, first. Uh, read Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 to 29. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant <clears throat> by the commission God gave me to present you the to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this ministry, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Why would Paul choose to enter into the service of God as a preacher? teacher, evangelist, missionary. Well, I, I think in the verses that we've read here this morning, we see uh, a handful of the things that come along with his service, the, the reasons why he does what he does. I think uh, the, the first thing that we have to focus on is on the suffering service that is rendered. Suffering service rendered. He became an apostle of the church, a preacher of the gospel message, and a servant of God when God called him and commissioned him. Maybe you remember back from the book of Acts um, how Paul came uh, to become Paul uh, and not a, uh, a Pharisee who was trying to tear apart the church but who was trying to build it up instead. This letter to the Colossians is being written by Paul from house arrest in Rome because of the commission that God gave to him. He's called him to be an apostle. And uh, in his ministry, which is over 30 years, he had been arrested and imprisoned at least three times during that ministry. And he spent a, a total of, of more than five years in chains for teaching and preaching about Jesus. I got asked not very long ago, had I ever been arrested because of my faith? And my answer was, well, currently, it's not against the law to be a follower of Jesus here. 
Paul has had that experience. He has been arrested, not just because of his faith, but because of his desire to help it spread around the whole Mediterranean world. Uh, You may not realize, but it was more than just being arrested a handful of times. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28, uh, Paul gives us a list of many different things that he encountered as a servant of Christ's church. There he says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received the 40 lashes from the Jews, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. And I'll put in there, they thought he was dead or they wouldn't have stopped. Three times I was shipwrecked and I spent a day and a night in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, from bandits, from my fellow Jews, from Gentiles, in the city, in the country, at sea, and from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul has been, since he was called by God, a servant who has suffered very much. When Paul writes here in Colossians 1 that he is filling up what is still lacking, Paul is not suggesting that somehow his own suffering makes up something. It it fulfills um, something that is lacking in the saving power of Christ's death. He is not on some incredible ego trip where he says that he and Jesus are partners in this and along with his suffering, we are all saved. He is not saying that by any stretch. But the pain and the suffering of Jesus brought about the reality of forgiveness and salvation for all of us. That salvation was fully accomplished by Jesus alone. Paul had nothing to do with that. But he does consider that his own troubles, as we've talked already, and his persecution are a service to Christ Jesus, and they end up being a benefit to the church, a service which Christ left for Paul and all those who follow Jesus to fulfill. We all will face, face difficulties and hardships because we're following Christ Jesus. Paul was repeatedly in chains. But when we read about those imprisonments, Not once do we read about his moaning and groaning and grousing and griping about the injustice of it all. Not once. Now, he's able to rejoice, but he's not rejoicing because of his jail time. He's rejoicing because of what he knows has been accomplished through his ministry. Because he was arrested for teaching and preaching the good news, there were people who actually got to hear and believe and accept that good news. If I got to go to jail so somebody can come to Jesus, Paul says, I'm in. I'm all for it. Everything that Paul went through was in the interests of others, especially for the benefit of the church. I'll point out, that it is easy for us to want to pray that those who have been imprisoned unjustly for their faith are released, that they're set free. But had Paul not been in prison, this letter probably wouldn't have been written, and we wouldn't have these words today. Sometimes there is not just rejoicing in hardship, but there is great benefit and blessing to more than one person because of it. James taught that a Christian can still rejoice even in the middle of hardship in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. And Paul can rejoice in suffering because the result 
was glory in God. There is a benefit and a blessing. If this furthers the, the kingdom's influence, then whatever is necessary, Lord. Suffering service. Following in the footsteps of his suffering master. We also get to see here in this passage a mysterious message revealed. Paul was commissioned um, to be a servant, but the specific duty of this servanthood was to present God's word in its entirety. He's no longer just teaching um, Old Testament promises like he had done in the synagogue for years and years and in the temple. But now he is teaching the fulfillment of all those promises in Christ Jesus. The message had been declared to the Jews for generations. And Paul now says here in Colossians 1 that the message of God's love and forgiveness will be declared to the Gentiles as well. In case you don't know who the Gentiles are, um, it's not the people who live on that road in Leighton. Okay, which is, I don't know if you've been there recently, but that road is bonkers. It used to be a cow path, right, Kathy? Exactly. Um, a Gentile is anybody who is not a Jew. So if you have Jewish heritage, you're not a Gentile. You're Jewish. But Paul is saying that this message isn't just for the Jews because they were God's original chosen people. But this message now applies to everybody. He wants everyone to hear it. Uh, later on in the passage, he talks about admonishing and teaching everyone, um, that everyone is used a number of times in the original language, and it means all. Not just anybody who's close, but all people. Admonishing all and teaching all so that all can be mature and complete in Christ. The emphasis right here is very clear that the long-awaited hidden mystery that's been around for generations is not just for a few, not just for the Jews, but it is revealed so that anybody, anywhere, can understand and respond to the gospel message. The fullness of the good news is for everyone. Not just the people who are willing to get cleaned up and come to church on the weekends. Not just the people who have registered to vote. Not just the people who um, pay their HOA fees. Not just the people that we can go on and on and on. It's not just the people that are easy and regular and comfortable and approachable. But the gospel message is for every single person. Um, let me read uh, verse 27 from a couple different translations. Uh, hopefully, you'll, you'll get the, the point driven in uh, clearly here. The, uh, the New Living Translation has it this way, For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. The contemporary English version says, and I, I like this one a lot, God did this because he wanted you Gentiles to understand his wonderful and glorious mystery. And the mystery is that Christ lives in you and he is your hope of sharing in God's glory. What's the mystery? Christ can live in us. Christ will live in us. And because of that, we have hope for a glorious, beautiful future in his presence. Christ is in you. Christ is in me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live in faith, faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul doesn't say, I will live in a Christ-like way. He doesn't say, I will glorify Christ through my behavior. 
what he says is Christ is alive and living in me. If you're a believer in Jesus, if you have surrendered your life to him, if he is your Lord and Savior, he took up residence. He abides with you. And because he lives in us, the Christian life is not a matter of trying to behave like Jesus, but allowing him, allowing him to live in us and to live through us. To be his vessel, his instrument. A suffering servant with a mysterious message. And one of the next pieces in the passage is um, the result of that message. Christ-powered progress. Christ-powered progress. Whenever I think about the power of God that is available to us in Christ Jesus, to do everything that he designed us to do and has commissioned, called us to do, I cannot help um, but think about the power team from my life as a youth minister. You ever heard about the power team? Has anybody ever heard about them? Okay, like three of us. Who, who's the other one? Me and Lance and who was the other hand? Oh, all guys my age. Okay. Um, okay, so back in the late 80s and through the 90s, um, at weeks of church camp usually, these, these humongous, muscle-bound uh, guys with incredible mullets and tight T-shirts would come to weeks of church camp, and they would perform amazing feats of strength um, for middle school campers. They would take one of those old-fashioned red rubber water bottles. You know what I'm talking about? Nod if you do. Okay, a few of you. That's good. Okay, so they're, they're pretty thick. It's not like blowing up a balloon, but they would put that over their mouth and they would blow them up until they were this big and until they would explode. Or they would take a phone book. Um, tell the people who are under 30 what that means. But, <laughs> but they would grab a hold of this three-inch thick phone book and they would rip across the pages and tear it in half with their bare hands. Um, a skillet would get rolled into like a Teflon taco in just a few seconds by these guys. And you know what made these feats possible? A hundred kids chanting, God's power, God's power, God's power, while they're doing all these things. As a non-middle school student, I often thought, well, this is a little bit of sh chicanery here, but... Um, we do have power available to us from God to do amazing things. Maybe not folding steel pans in half. Paul's ministry and his faithfulness were energized by the power of God in Christ Jesus. He went through so much difficulty. How did he endure it? What kept pushing him forward through all the struggles of ministry? Why could he sing and shout hallelujah from the depths of prison cells all around the Mediterranean world? God's power. God's power. God's power. Available in Christ Jesus. Paul pushes forward towards maturity for all, and he is energized by Christ to do that. He wants every believer to become mature with all wisdom. Most of us seem to think that once somebody um, claims Christ as their Savior and they're baptized, they're pretty much done. They're, they're good. They've, they've crossed the, 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 the line. They're in the camp. They're on the team. Great. Which is good. But that's not the end. That is the launching pad. That's the, the starting block. A believer in Jesus will experience constant growth and change as Christ works out his character in us. This is the desired end, that every single one of us will be fully grown, mature, and complete in 
Christ. Not just the Sunday school teacher or the elder or the pastor, but every single follower of Christ. There is nothing more disappointing and, and saddening than seeing somebody who has, had claimed Christ as their Savior 40 years ago who has made zero progress. They are just as selfish and just as shallow and, and just as lost as they were the moment they came out of the baptistry. Those who believe in Christ Jesus cannot not grow. We must allow him to grow in us. And that perspective is what drives the Apostle Paul. He says at the end that he is contending, um, he is striving, fighting. Uh, the word is agonizing, um, toiling on behalf of his faith. He won't stop because there are people who need to hear the message and those who have heard the message need to continue to grow. But Paul doesn't say that that is something that he's brought about. He's not responsible for it. Whatever occurs is accomplished only through the power that is given to him through Christ Jesus. Paul says that Christ energizes us with his powerful energy. It's not just a little burst, but long-lasting, constantly available power to do whatever he's designed us for and has called us to do. Through faith in Christ, we can link our life with a source of strength that enables us to rise above our natural limitations. How can we serve faithfully and deeply? It is only through the power of Christ in us. If we could do the kinds of things that God wants us to do without Jesus, then his death on the cross was meaningless. We must have Jesus inside us in order to do what God has designed us and called us to do. Because he abides, because he resides in us, we are renewed in his energy to live and to serve and to worship. And that brings us to the last part of the passage. Chapter 1, verse 27, one more time. Christ in you the hope of glory. I don't think there is a more beautiful phrase in all the New Testament. The living Lord Jesus inside of us brings us the hope of glory. That's why this passage is in this sermon series. The hope of glory. As we've said again and again in the last two months, biblical hope isn't this wispy, wishy washy dreaming that something could possibly occur. It's not something we take to the genie of the lamp or that we blow out on the birthday cake. Biblical hope is joyful, confident expectation, a sure conviction of what is to come. No question. Jesus has promised, and so he is coming back to take us to be where he is. What is the object of our hope? Glory. The incredible, wonderful blessedness that God designed and that God promised his people, um, they will enter it when Christ returns. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, uh, read this way. Therefore, we do not lose heart. This passage could very easily have been inserted here in Colossians. We do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day through Christ's power. If our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Biblical hope is all about our conviction of the unseen yet unfulfilled promises of God. 
Christ dwelling in the believer is the ground of certainty of complete salvation. We don't have to sit and stew in our worries about how we are with Jesus. Instead, we can rest and relax in the promise made by one who is absolutely, totally faithful. And as he abides in us, we rest and relax in the confident hope of heaven. This resting, residing, um, this indwelling Jesus is what drives Paul's ministry. The good news is not about a system. It's not about a code of living. It's not about a path for life. The good news is about a glorious, living, life-changing person, Jesus. Christ Jesus brings hope and he brings new life to his people. He is the source of life. He is the source of change and he is the source of of joy. If you want to talk about what your next steps in faith are, I hope that you'll talk to me, that you'll talk to Zach, that you'll talk to one of our other church leaders today. We're going to pray in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to ask you all to stand uh, in just a second. And if you're ready um, to make a public declara declaration of your faith in Christ, if you're ready to be baptized into Jesus, I hope that you'll come and meet me down here uh, while, while I pray. Let's pray. <clears throat> if you'd stand with me, please. Father, we ask that the risen Christ Jesus will come and invade us, that he will take over in our lives, that he will take up residence in us. So Lord, abide, indwell, remain in us. Help us to live out the good news. Give us joy in our struggles. Renew us with your power and grant us rest in the certainty of your presence and of heaven. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. <clears throat> brings us to our time of uh, communion, as it does every weekend. Um, if I could have four men come and begin to serve the congregation, please. Um, if you are watching from home, uh, if uh, you would make sure to have your bread and grape juice ready uh, so you can partake with us in just a few moments. <clears throat> Here at Roy Christian Church, um, we celebrate the Lord's Sunday, uh, the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Um, it is something that we feel um, that there is a strong pattern for in the New Testament. While there are other churches that might do it once a month or once a quarter or a, a few special times a year, we believe that it is just as important for us to do it every time we're gathered as the, the church family. <clears throat> um, just, just imagine if, if we saved um, a hug or a kiss for our spouse for just a few times here because we wouldn't want it to become too commonplace. You know, we wouldn't want it to get old. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Uh, we we want to experience that connection over and over again. Uh, we want to, to celebrate that, that union. And so every time we're together as the body of Christ, we celebrate in this meal to remind us that we are all in need of his rescue, that we all have been saved by his forgiveness, that we are all recipients of his grace and mercy. And we don't just celebrate that a few times a year, we want to constantly be aware of his incredible love for us. Let's pray. Father, uh, we ask that this morning as we partake of this meal, 
that we would be reminded of just how much you love us, that um, we, we believe that people love us when we are at our best, uh, when we have been the most kind, the most generous, the most loving, the most, um, the most forgiving. But Lord, we know that you love us not just when we're at our best, but you have loved us at our absolute worst. You see beyond the facade. We put up the face, we wear the mask that says that everything is good. That we're, we're sweet and kind and gracious. But you see through all that veneer to who we really are. And you love us anyway. Thank you so much, Father, for the, the gift of new life that we have because of Christ's death on the cross, the forgiveness that we have, uh, and the, the hope of resurrection because of his defeat of the grave. Be with us now as we partake together through Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Mark's account of the Last Supper in chapter 14 says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. I pray that you've been encouraged, that you've been challenged uh, to walk and to grow with Jesus while we've been together this morning. Uh, let me bring our live stream to a close this morning with words from the, uh, from the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind, and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We hope to see you again very soon. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, while the band comes now,